whenever a job like this opens, obviously you want to discuss candidates. It's extremely early. And let's let me emphasize one thing here. Performance this season will also have an impact on what the candidate pool really is, barring there being some sort of situation where it's, you know, it's a few people at Maryland and a coach and his representative. And those are the only people that know. And there's some sort of deal that's agreed to in, say, late January or whatever, barring that kind of situation happening and surfacing, you will have coaches having good teams in January into February making tournament runs and how that might impact. Cause obviously you want to time this. Well, you don't want to have a situation where you'd hire someone and they're in the midst of a bad run or they're on their, they're on the downturn as one example with this, you know, Mike Bray knows the area. Well, uh, Mike Bray has told me on the record multiple times, Notre Dame will be his final um, college basketball job. So never say never with any of that. I don't even know if Mike Bray would be, you know, top three candidate for Maryland, but he has done a really good job for a long time at Notre Dame, but it's kind of a little bit on the downturn. We'll see if he can get it turned around there. He knows, you know, demathetize the whole deal. You'll probably see his name float out there. I wouldn't expect that, but whatever. Uh, some names, I would say, if you're looking for a coach that's done well from the area, that's really outside the box. Again, this is just initial teams, guys that I would consider. Andy Enfield is from that area and has done a really good job at USC. I don't know if you want to leave Southern Cal to go to Maryland. Don't know if Maryland would consider him among the top of, of their list, but he's one that pops to mind. Kevin Willard definitely pops to mind there. He's had a really good run at Seton Hall. I could see Kevin Willard coaching 10 more years at Seton Hall. I could also see a situation where Kevin Willard wants to choose a change of scenery, wants a reboot, and then we'll kind of wait and see. That kind of feels like almost like, let's see what Seton Hall looks like this season. And if they're really, really good, maybe his name becomes even hotter. Uh, Mark Schmidt at St. Bonaventure has deserved a bigger job for five years at this point. I would absolutely put him on my list if I was Maryland. Um, and then Mark Pope at BYU is a coach that I think just, it doesn't matter where he goes. He's going to, he's inevitably going to, if he wants it, they're going to the big 12, but that's not happening for a couple of years. They're basically running like a high major program at BYU. Now, uh, again, I'm not assigning a t intention to any of these coaches. This is me scanning on my own over the past 30 minutes and looking what coaches might make sense. Those are the ones you mentioned, Kim English. He's from the area. He just started at George Mason. Not that he couldn't be the next coach at Maryland or anything like that. He's from the area. They beat Maryland. I get all that. Maryland fans are probably already side eyeing. We made jokes on the podcast about it, Parrish. I don't know. He's really young. We'll have to wait and see on that. And then there's one coach that's a big name that I'm not sure if he's ever going to return to college coaching, but I'll just mention him here. John Beeline is 68. I mean, he's got a role with the Pistons now. You know, he'd be a good hire, but how long would he want to coach there? I don't I don't know how likely that would or would not be. So, you know, just to, to feed the curiosity of those listeners, because once this happens, you're always thinking about who's next. That's just an initial scanning. Don't know if it'll be any of those guys. And I think there's a good chance that once we get to the middle of February, there could be two or three guys at different schools that make a lot of sense based on the success they've had this season. Um, You were joking earlier when you mentioned Rick Patino. I, I don't think that's crazy. I it's just not don't. crazy. I just I mean. There is nothing about Rick Patino or the sport of college basketball that disqualifies him from being a high major coach. Literally nothing. You look around the country, we don't have to name names, and look at some of the other people who are still coaching college basketball at a high major level. Um, what they've been accused of is, is far worse as it pertains to NCAA rules than what Rick Patino was actually accused of. Like, I know that Rick's program was involved in some wild stuff. But what has Rick actually been accused of? Um, it, it, it's not disqualifying. If, if I, I'll tell you this, if I were Maryland, I'd at least, I'd at least think about it. Uh, another name that somebody tossed out at me, you know, right before we started this podcast, um, Archie Miller, but, but struggling, struggling in the conference. Well, that's the problem is like, if you're Maryland, do you go, I mean, and, and let me be clear. That's something I would, uh, that's something I would consider. I would at least think about it, talk about it. Um, you know, Archie went from the hottest young coach in America to fired, but like, I don't think he got dumber or a worse coach while I was at Indiana. It just didn't, didn't go the way um, any of us thought it was going to go. But the problem would be if you're Maryland, we just fired somebody for being good, not great, you know, and you just got fired. 
we just fired somebody at a historically strong program for being good, but not great. And you just got fired from a historically strong program for being good, not great. We don't need to go down that one again. Listen, they'll end up with a good coach, or at least they should, because this is, you're exactly right, um, one, of the, one of the better jobs in America. It, it's got history. It's got a passionate fan base. Um, the recruiting area, which I think it's reasonable to say Mark uh, didn't. Uh, capitalize on as much as he should have or or another person might. Uh, the recruiting area is incredible. You got a natural recruiting base. And then um, that Under Armour affiliation is a real thing. I, I don't know how how much it works, you know, post-FBI scandal, but I can just tell you it was working pre-FBI scandal. And I even talked to Mark about that, and he never hit from it. He said one of the reasons he was interested in the Maryland job when he was interested in the Maryland job was because he knew un Under Armour, you know, was – was going to be an advantage for Maryland the same way Nike's an advantage for, you know, Kentucky Duke, the same way Adidas was trying to be an advantage for Louisville and Kansas. And so when you combine all that stuff, um, you've got a, you know, I don't know whether it's top 10, top 15, top 20, but it's a very good job. How about this? Um, in power conferences, there are, um, you know, there, there's a lot of those jobs and only, you know, I, I don't know what the number is, but there, there's, there's certain places where you can go hire some other good programs, great coach. Um, you can get them to leave. And I think Maryland is one of those jobs. You know, the last time they had to hire, they hired Texas A&M's coach. Not any power five program could go hire Texas A&M's coach once Texas A&M's got it going under that coach. But Maryland could, for all the reasons I've already stated. This is you can go take somebody else's good, accomplished coach, and I suspect um, that that's what they'll try to do.